Um, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And when we're in the world and we're trying to do it on our own, we can't overcome anything, can we? But when we're in Him, we're able to do all things through Christ, who strengtheneth us. And uh, He's a great God and Father. We've been having such an awesome day today. And um, I got a victory report here. Um, Heidi Wallace, um, who's in charge of the Get Fit ministry, found a place to work out after we removed to our temporary location in Germany. Amen. We're thankful for that. Our women can work out and exercise and still be lost. Amen. Um, we want to also, Heidi has is asking. Uh, is chosen as a match for bone marrow donation, praying for the recipient as well as quick healing after the procedure. Amen. That's right. It's a good thing. Mary Gasway, uh, we want to pray for her. She's home recovering. Ask God to touch her and speedy recovery. Oh, she's here tonight? All right. Sister Mary. Amen. So glad you're with us tonight. Amen. Get some sisters around you and pray over you. Uh, Sister Jillian Bennett, uh, submitted by Ingrid Spence for protection. And we also uh, are glad that Nolita Moses is in church tonight. She's out of the hospital, out of the woods, but she, now she has a cold and we want to get around her. Some sisters filled with the Holy Ghost and pray over her that God will touch her body and remove that infection from her system. She'll be good as new. Praise God. If you have if you have need for prayer and you're in this place and you would like someone to pray with you, I'd ask you to stand right now. All right. So okay. All right. We got a couple here. Some in the back. All right. Sister Moses, please stand. We'll get around Sister Mary Gasaway. Church, let's stand and uh, go to these that need prayer and let's lift them up to the Lord and. Pray right now. Father, hallelujah. We praise you, God. And we thank you for your presence here, God. It's such a beautiful thing, God, when you move in our midst, God. And we so thankful, Father. Hallelujah. That we can come to you, Lord, when there's a need. Hallelujah. When there's a situation in our life, God, to where we can't do it on our own, Lord. We're so grateful that we have a Father to take it to. And we lift these needs up to you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, for a speedy recovery. Hallelujah for Sister Gassaway. We're so grateful that she's in the house of God tonight worshiping you. And Sister Moses, God, we thank you for healing her, God, of this cold Lord. We bless you for it. Thank you for it. Thank you for touching every need here tonight, God. Thank you for providing for those that are hurting financially, God. Oh, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for deliverance, God, from the things that are holding us back, God, the things that are oppressing us, God. We bless you. We magnify you. Hallelujah. 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 We thank you for bringing our Senior pastor, home safe, God. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you for being a lifter up of our heads. Hallelujah, the healer of all of our disease. Touch to me, Ramsey, right now, God. Strengthen her, God. In Jesus' name. And continue to strengthen her.
want to give him a hand, praise, and thanksgiving and victory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. We're going to receive our offering and march. We're going to march tonight. I want everyone to participate in that. God is a He's a giving God. Are you glad about that? Oh my goodness. He is a giving God. He knows exactly what we need, when we need it. He's able to provide everything that we need in our life. Amen. One of the areas of obedience to the scriptures is in our giving. The Bible calls that to an alignment in our life. It shows priority. It also shows importance. Amen. And the work of God is important. We believe that. Amen. Amen. And obedience is important. So we want you to give to the Lord. Allow Him to be a part of your life, your family's life. And allow the blessings of the Lord. The Bible says that the windows of heaven would open up. The devourer would be rebuked from our home. That we would be able to reap that that we have sown. It's all principle based. In our giving. You don't have to proclaim Christianity in your life to receive the benefits of living a principle. You don't have to. You live the principle, there's a benefit to living that principle. But thank the Lord we have an understanding that goes beyond just that one thing. It goes into our relationship with God, our lifestyle to Him. Amen. Amen. If you need an envelope, our ushers have envelopes for you. Amen. Why don't we stand? Everybody, everybody's going to march. Say, everybody's going to march. Turn to your neighbor and say, everybody means me. No, it means me. Turn to somebody else and say, everybody means me. Hallelujah. We'll pray over the offering after we received it, pronouncing God's blessing in our life. As musicians play, why don't you come and give to the Lord and we'll pray.
just a couple of announcements that we want to make sure that you are aware of. It's important uh, that the end of the month, October the 30th, uh, is our Caribbean dinner. And it is an opportunity. You can either take away the food or you can eat it on the premises. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that's a fifth Sunday. It's a fifth Sunday, so there is no service or life group that night. So you have that opportunity to uh, stay in the Family Life Center and eat or just take it away. But it's important that we uh, start finding out how many plates that we're going to need. And so after the service, from here on out, after every service, there's going to be opportunity for you to purchase the tickets. And they are $15 for adult, $10 for kids ages 7 to 10, $5 for 6 and under. And... Uh, it's a curry chicken, jerk chicken, or jerk pork, white rice, or rice with peas, plantains and salad, or fried chicken, potato salad, green bean, roll, dessert, and a drink. And man, 30th is a long way away. So out in the foyer, you can purchase tickets. All right, for the Caribbean dinner. We need to know, we have to know. Also, educational excellence, if you can and would like to volunteer your time to be a tutor, if you um, are skilled in a certain subject matter, and uh, we'd like to hook you up with a student that is in need, or a student that's going through that particular class. So we're trying to hook everybody up. It's important that we find out who you are so we can do that. Not only the tutor, but also the student. And you can see Sister Karen nurse immediately after the service in the foyer. Hallelujah, there's my piece of paper. And this Thursday, or this Friday and Saturday, I don't know if you are able to show that, that video, Sister Ruth, are you able to do that? Okay. All right, we'll do it here in just a second. Life leaders, if you're a life leader, say amen. Amen. All right, life leaders, we have a CD of some songs that you are familiar with, uh, and you can get them. Only life leaders, please. Only life leaders. After the service, get a CD, and we'll be we'll be. This is just our first attempt at doing this, and uh, we're going to have some more coming out here pretty soon. But this will get us through this next weekend and maybe uh, another life group. But pretty soon we're going to expand that CD uh, system. But after the service, please get uh, your CD of your new songs. Amen? Amen. Amen. I hesitate to even touch the lights. I hesitate to do that. But uh, let's see that video. Right here, Elena, he's going to be right here. All right, uh, let's 
TCN, he's going to be right here. No representation from the Dominguez family as of yet. Unless you have to work. Yes. Amen. Um, is there anybody that has graduated from high school that has not signed up and you haven't reached the age of 30? Not signed up yet? Wave your hand and just jump all around. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I encourage you to be a part of it. We've had a blast the last couple of years and uh, anticipate having a great time. We spent the night it's in Winchester, Virginia. Amen. God bless you. Sister Phyllis, God bless you. Bless us with a song. Hey. song on the radio, it's called The Blessings, and I relate it to every word of this song, and it talks about asking God for things, and I'm like, I do that, I'm asking for almost exactly what, you know, healing, prosperity, and my problem is I get very impatient, and I get confused when it doesn't happen on my time frame. When I go to God in prayer, He says, be still. Or He says, believe. And when He says both of those, I know He's working on it, whatever my request was. That I need to calm down and let Him do what He does best, and that is, be God. And I'm so grateful that He speaks those words of wisdom, and they comfort me. Because when He says, just believe, I mean, what else can I do? And there's a word, there's a, a sentence in this song that says, um, "All the while you hear each desperate plea, and that, and long that we'd have faith to believe." So God is working on whatever you've requested of Him, and whatever I've requested. We just need to believe, and I'm just so thankful that He's there and that He's there to bless us.
We, it was about a five hour drive. We, we stopped at the store and bought oil and we, I mean, we, we were, we were going to, we were, we were, they had us stand in a Sunday school room and uh, we didn't care, man, we were preaching, we were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We got in there in the church, they let us in and then left. And we went to work. We started anointing every pew. We went on that end of the pew and worked our way down the other end of the pew. We anointed the doors. We went through every classroom, anointed the seats. By the time we got to Saturday night, we were exhausted. And the next morning, <laughs> when the, the, the six of them showed up, I think it was the Bridge Club, actually. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the pianist. I said, Jeff. Jeff said, Sister, I just want you to play a little bit in the background while I preach. Now he's thinking, you know, he's gonna preach and she's gonna whatever do. Na -na 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 -na. And uh, he reads his text, and she's just, she's just playing, and she starts playing hymns. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the And he, he do that, him and her, do that for like an hour. God, I was about to go crazy. I don't know why I told you that story, except it reminded me of... doing where did she go oh you're over there Are you paying attention to me nope you trying to get Tawana to come to the youth retreat or the young adult retreat you can't talk like they do That was good. Thank you very much for your help. That reminds me of the story. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Huh? Uh, yeah, you didn't. Yes, you didn't know me then. Yeah. You weren't in that story. <laughs> There's actually really very nothing before you really in my life means anything. <laughs> One of the most important principles that you can build on the foundation, we talked about the foundation quite extensively earlier. One of the most important frameworks that you can build your house of is the understanding that we are different from the world. Calm down. I know that was a really challenging concept. We may say to ourselves that we don't care what others think of us. But in reality, most of us want to fit in and be accepted. Regardless of what circle we're in or where we find ourselves. However, if we are to be true Christ-like Christians, we will never, everybody say never. never. We will never fit into this world's value system. Amen. And as Christians, as called out ones, as separated ones, we 
have to fight our natural tendency to conform to this world because its values and its priorities opposes Christ's values and priorities. So tonight I want to challenge you and leave you with a few thoughts and evaluate our own personal priorities and help us determine whether our lifestyle more closely reflects the world's values or God's values. Sounds a lot heavier than it's going to be. Because we don't have time to get too heavy. But I need you to ask yourself a question. What, in your opinion, would most clearly distinguish you from your non-Christian friends? These are answers for you to reflect in your own mind upon. What is it about you? I have to ask myself, what is it about me? When I'm with and I'm around non-Christians, what is it about me that is clearly distinguished as different. And there's a variety of answers for that. Maybe you look different. Maybe you talk different. Maybe you don't go where they end up going. Maybe in the conversation you don't, you, you remove yourself. Maybe you are unable to relate to their functions and their realities. I don't know. What do you think the, what worldly priorities do you think are most challenging for Christians not to adopt as their own today? When we look at the world's priorities and what their agenda is and what the agenda of the cosmos, the world is, what is it that you find as an individual as the most challenging not to adopt into your own lifestyle, into your own existence. What is it that challenges you? It puts you right on the edge of saying, mm, ah, maybe, maybe a little bit. Maybe, maybe a little bit. And how can we guard against having worldly priorities. We talk about worldly, the cosmos, versus godly or heavenly priorities or values in our life. How can I guard against it? Is there really anything to guard against? Should I be guarding against it? Is it something that I need to worry about? This priority of the world becoming my priority, or is that even a big deal? These are basic, fundamental questions that I believe at some point in time we must answer if we are going to have a house that stands in the storm. Not a foundation. We have already established that the correct foundation and what an incorrect foundation is. We've already established that with a correct foundation, an incorrect house can fall. Or with an incorrect foundation, a correct house can fall. So we are moving from the foundation to the actual structure. These types of questions are what builds our value system and what's important and what's not important as a priority in our life. And maybe even think about what desire or what habit has recently interfered with, well, our commitment to God. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2, 
verse number 15 through 17. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Well, that sounds straight, doesn't it? That sounds rough. Doesn't it? It's not a trick question. It sounds rough, doesn't it? I mean, what, what do you mean love not the things in the world? Man, I love pizza. You know, is that what you're talking about? I love driving my, my truck. That's from the world. Is that, is, that what, is that what it's referring to? I mean, do we just all go hide so that we don't have any love for the things that are around us? He goes on and he qualifies what it's referring to in verse 16. He says, for all that is in the world. This is what he is going to give us a list of the things that he's referring to when he says, love not the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Everybody say that, the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. And the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So very quickly, we are able to separate very quickly those types of things like, and I say this, you know, facetiously, pizza, right? That's not what he's talking about. Unless, I guess, it consumes you. He's not necessarily talking about a vehicle. Unless you become homeless in order to make the payments. Right? He categorizes very quickly the principles of how to build a successful structure in our life. It goes on in verse 17 and says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. All sin, all worldliness, all things that are diametrically opposed to God fall into these three categories. Verse 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of Every single sin, every single thing that separates us from God will fall into those three categories. The principle that we must constantly be presenting in our home is that you, my son, you, my daughter, you, my wife, we as a family are different right. from this world. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We're different. Right. We're different. The only way leaders of the homes that are in here tonight, the only way that you and I can successfully say those words to the individuals in which we have been given responsibility of and for is if we ourselves believe it. Amen. Great. If I don't believe the necessity and the need of being different from the world, the principle of the called out ones, the separated ones, the ones that have been called for a specific purpose. If I don't believe that, then I will be unsuccessful 
and transmitting that principle to anybody else that I am responsible for. Amen. Thus, the blood of my family will be upon my hands. There must first be a convincing in my own spirit, yes. an understanding in my own life that the love of the world is what separates me from God. Come on now. When we love the world and we love the things in it, then our priorities are worldly. Right. Worldly priorities are categorized by these three attitudes. The lust of the flesh, the attitude of the cravings of sinful man. We are flesh until that trumpet sounds and we are changed to be like him and our mortal inputs immortality and corruption puts on incorruption. We will be subjected to our flesh and its desires and its cravings. And if I give in to the cravings of my flesh, then I take on the priorities of this world. And if I begin to live the priorities of this world, then my life takes a drastic turn in the direction in which it's headed. Preoccupation with gratifying physical desires. And I can't wait to get home. There's something on. I gotta. I just don't want to miss it. I've heard those words before. I can't wait to get home because I've got to see this particular show. Preoccupation with gratifying physical desires. All I can think about is satisfying my flesh. That is the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. Bowing to the God of materialism. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. There's nothing wrong with, with uh, looking sharp. There's nothing wrong with being presentable. There's nothing wrong with driving a nice car or living in a nice house unless it becomes the total focus of your existence. That the only way to obtain those things is to do away with other things such as family time, church time, being an ambassador of Christ, reflecting His glory, working two and three jobs, making sure that you get as much overtime as to make that car payment or that house payment. Bowing down to the God of materialism is what we call a priority of the world. You know, how many have ever thought, man, if I just had a million dollars, I would be set. Yeah. Man, I mean, it would be, phew, I would be, I would be set. Set. Can I just tell you how, how false that is? Seriously, can I just tell you how false that is? Take a million dollars. You know how fast you can spend a million dollars? Oh, but you, wait a minute, you, you just said it would be set. Because the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go buy a big house. Oh, yeah, you will. Yeah, you will. Now, now I'm going to put it away. I'm going to sock it away. Now, what's, what's a nice house? Five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000? 700000 Right? That's a nice house, right? Get up on where some of y'all live on the right side of the tracks. A million dollars ain't nothing. It ain't nothing. You, 
You buy a $700,000 house, and then you're going to want a pool in the backyard. That's going to be another $70,000. Then you're going to you got to buy all new furniture, because you ain't bringing that old ratty stuff that you got in your apartment. You ain't bringing that in that house. No, you're going to spend 10, 20 grand, whatever, on, on all that stuff. You certainly ain't driving around in that car no more. You're going to spend another 40 or 50, 60. Thousand dollars on a vehicle, and then you're gonna to have to figure out: Do I turn these lights on or do I leave them off? <laughs> do I heat this pool? Because in about two years, you're saying, "Man, I can't afford the upkeep on all this stuff." Come on, man. Come on. So then we say, "Well, all right, if I had ten million." <laughs> 10 million. I mean, that, that's, what, that's what we need to build this building. Surely we can live on that. 10 million. Y'all are a little less, a little less anxious on that one. You don't think you can handle that 10 million wouldn't do it for you? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. It doesn't matter what level financially that you reach. There's enough stuff to buy at whatever level you find yourself at. It take you it may take you a year or two. You get 10 million, 30 million, you hear about these people winning 150 million, we're like, I can, I can. You do a little research on people that win the lottery. Very low percentage of people actually are still like not living in a trailer. <laughs> no sooner did I think maybe 10 million would be, that'd be good. I got all the magazine called The Rob Report. Anybody ever seen The Rob Report? Yeah. There ain't nothing in there that has less than like seven zeros on it. Clothes, watches. They've got their classifieds are land for islands for sale, yachts, planes. I thought we were just talking about going down to, you know, uh, Marlowe Furniture and getting some, you know, furniture. No, no, no. When you got ten million, you don't go to Marlowe Furniture. We don't even know the names of the stores that we would go to. <laughs> store. You got, you got to pay a cover charge just to get in those stores. <laughs> the God of materialism is never satisfied. Until we ourselves find satisfaction in the priorities that we adhere to godly priorities, we will never find satisfaction in worldly priorities. Because they cannot be satisfied. The lust of the eyes is bowing down to the God of materialism and boasting of what he has and does. Obsession with one's status or importance. Obsession. This area is bloated with obsession of one's status or importance. A lot of times that comes from not having a good upbringing or being in a bad situation. And once we finally hit the big time, we want to tell somebody about it. Hey, oh, hey, you see this right here? Hey, yeah, I didn't get this at Kmart, okay? Right here. Because I remember, you know, back when I didn't have a suit, right? So now that I got one, I want you to know about it. It's from a lack of satisfaction, fulfillment on the inside, so we look on the outside to find what brings satisfaction and fulfillment to our life, and it is always reaching for more because the last thing 
didn't quite do it. What, what, what am I talking about? I'm talking about in our homes, we have to build this into the structure, the fabric of our homes. Because our children and our wives, the ladies of this church, and the men are bombarded every single day from the values and the priorities that are of this world. Right. And they call for what we are created, our flesh. They call the flesh. And if we have not solidified, and we have not concreted, and we have not nailed down that we are different from this world, then we will be driven by every wind of value that this world comes up with. Amen. The cravings of a sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does. By contrast, God's values of self-control God's values of a spirit of generosity. God's values, a commitment to humble service. We must take a hard look at how we're building our homes to align our priorities with God's priorities. You know, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life interesting place that we find our Savior in, in Luke chapter 4. And I don't have a lot of time, but I want to give you this little bit here. Luke chapter 4. I took all my extra time this morning, I think. Luke chapter 4. Hit your Bibles if you will, because this is a, a 14 verse passage that I want you to I want you to When you're on the screen, you can just see one verse at a time. I want you to see sort of, I want you to see everything. Say amen if you don't have it. All right, we'll let you, we'll let you keep coming. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Actually, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of them speak of this story, but this, this rendition, this view, uh, I like the most. I like Luke's rendition of Some of the passages, uh, other writers, don't give us all the details. Some of the writers are very short in their description of this. This is the temptation and the fasting of Jesus Christ in the wilderness. How many is familiar with the story? How many, just from your memory of the story, who was with Jesus when all this happened? Now we got writings from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They wrote about it. They told us the stories. Who was with them? Jesus, that is. Who was with Jesus during this time? Satan. He was definitely one of them. Who else? Angels. There's definitely... There's definitely indication of angels being present. Anyone else? It may, it's, I don't think it's in Luke's rendition, but it's in one of the other uh, writings. Wild beasts. Wild beasts we know don't talk, except we know of a donkey, but I don't think the wild beast told the story. Angels, they're sent. I don't think sent them. So my point is this, is that when this, this occasion, this, this thing that Jesus went through evidently was so important to him that he took the time to sit down and retell the story of exactly what happened. 
wasn't necessarily something that you, you, you sit down and talk about, but there is a value to this story that evidently he wants and he wanted to be made known. Verse 1, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led, everybody say was led, led. by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days, tempted of the devil, and in those days he did not eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Pure humanity. We relate to that. We understand that. We fast for five minutes and we're hungry. <laughs> Verse number three. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command these, this stone that it be made bread. Jesus answered him, saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whom, whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him into Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hand they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Basically what he's saying is go ahead and jump and the angels will make sure that you are not hurt. Jesus answering said to him, It, it is said thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for what? Season. What does that mean? Just for a little while. Verse 14. After the temptations, after speaking the what? The word to the devil. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Verse 1, he was led by the Spirit. Verse 14, he returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And he went through these three worldly priorities and he conquered every single one of those worldly priorities the lust of the flesh if you be the son of God turn this stone into bread the lust of the flesh he conquered how did he conquer it? He conquered it through the word. It is written. The only way that you and I are going to be able to conquer the flesh, the priorities or the values of this world system, is to make sure that we have the word alive in our life. Amen. He conquered the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It's all about a heart issue at the end of the day. Amen. Where is my heart? The Bible says that he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God. His heart was in the right place. 
He was doing the will of the Father. Yet he needed to conquer some things to solidify his identity, not only to himself, but also to the rest of the world Amen. as to who he was. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, most of what we go through is to challenge who we are as people of God. And when we fall, and when we falter, we begin to question our identity in Him, which is exactly what the devil wants you to do. But when you come out victorious on the other side, there's no doubt people in here say, man, I'm a child of the King. I made it through that. I'm blood bought. I'm a chosen generation. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a child of Him. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. It becomes a solidifying of your identity because of the priorities and the values of God that you take on. It's important. It was so important for God to go through this wilderness experience. And this is where I'm going to end. The Bible tells us that at one point when Jesus was walking on the earth and doing the miracles, the people wanted to crown him as king. You remember that? Yeah. But Jesus, he already conquered that. The humanity side of our Savior could have been pulled in that direction. The fleshly side, because he was both man and God at the same time, 100% man, 100% God, at the exact same time, there was that flesh that hungered, there was that flesh that thirsted, there was that flesh that needed rest, there was that flesh that had desires. And when he got to the point where the miracles and the signs and the wonders rose up in the eyes of the people. They desired to make him king, but it was not his time yet. Right. Right. And the Bible says that he slipped off through the crowd. You know why? Because he'd already conquered that in his life. Because the devil took him up showed him all the cities of the world during that temptation time. And he said, if you bow down to me, I'll make you king. I'll make you ruler. And Jesus, through the struggle of the temptation, brought out the word of God and he said, I am different from this value system. I'm different from this priority that you're bringing me. And in the name of the word, I conquer this in my life. Not knowing that eventually his flesh was going to be tempted later on. But he had already conquered that. And built his home correctly. And when it came time for the flesh to be brought to that point of making a decision. The Bible says it didn't bother him. Didn't even tempt him. It wasn't even an issue with him. He just disappeared off through the crowd and went about his way because his flesh had already come under subjection with the word. When he was brought to the pinnacle of the temple, And the devil tells him, why don't you jump down from here? You won't be hurt. Jump down and show your power. Jump down and call the angels. What he did not know, well, he, if you understand what I'm saying in, in humanity, he did not know that his greatest work was going to be that he was going to lay his flesh on a cross. And he was not going or should. He 
he could not come down on his own power. He had to go through the cross experience. But when he got to that cross experience, he had already conquered the temptation to do away with harm to his body. Because his greatest work was ahead of him. As he laid his head down on that rock the night before, and he said, Lord, if it be possible, let this come pass for me. There was something on the inside of him that said, I've already conquered this. I conquered this temptation in the wilderness. I conquered this thing through the word. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What are you saying, Pastor? What I'm saying is begin to build the value system in your home yes. right now. Yes. Begin to build the priorities of God in your home right now. Yes. Because there's coming a day. There's coming a day that they're going to want to make you king. And you're going to be tempted. That flesh is going to be in between the tension between the world and between heaven. And that flesh if it hasn't already gone through the prioritizing a value system, there's a good chance that day that Jesus would have said, yeah, bring it on. Make me a king. Put a crown on my head. And it would have been a temporary fulfillment, just like all sin is. He built his value system early on. Yes. So that when the cross came to his life and he had the authority and he had the ability just like you and I do, we have the choice whether we're going to take up our cross and follow him. Yes, preach. What, is, what about it? When our kids go off to college and all of a sudden, they're faced with all these values and priorities. And they're faced with all this stuff. And it's, it, there's nobody there saying, come on, pick up the cross. Come on, don't take the crown. Come on. It's going to show a whole lot whether the home was built correctly. Or whether or not this is the first time they ever heard about a cross and a crown in their life. It's more than just saying, oh, pastor doesn't want us to do that. That means nothing. That means nothing. You use our name in vain, God's going to get you for that. Don't you use our name to get your kids to do stuff. And all that shows me is that you don't have it on the inside. Right, that's right. Preach, preach. Amen. Come on. Come on. Moms and dads, single moms, single dads, singles, young adults. So that's why the Bible tells us today is the day of salvation. Because there's coming a day where it's not going to be the devil. We're not going to be able to see it as clearly as we see it in the wilderness. There's coming a day where, Brother Griffin, it's not going to be as, as evident and obvious. Right. If I haven't taken care of it already, right. it's going to come at me in a way that I'm not expecting. Oh. But you know what? If my mom and dad teach me if my wife or my husband encourages me,
when that day comes, I'll be able to just walk away from it and say, I've already conquered that. Yes. Amen. That doesn't affect me. Right. That doesn't appeal to me. That doesn't bother me. I came out of my wilderness experience full of the power of the Holy Ghost. It was from that point on that Jesus began to do the miracles that we read about. We don't read of anything prior to that temptation experience and that conquering of the three vital areas of value and priorities. We don't read of anything except when he was born and when he was 12 years old. And all he did was wow people with his speech. But when he was led by the Spirit and he came out in the power, that's when he turned the world upside down. Let's say Building our home. Building our home. Building our home. Martin, you're different from the world. Rain, you're different from the world. Monique, you're different from her. Our family's different from her. Our home is different from her. And there may be things we still got to conquer in our own lives, kids. There may be things that we haven't yet come up against. But we're going to do it together. We're going to do it as a family. Young adults, you got to make decisions. Do I turn the stone into bread? Do I jump and not get hurt? Do I bow down so that I can have a little bit of fun and fulfillment, popularity? Or do I conquer it now so that it really is going to make a difference. Can you imagine if Jesus, when they said, if you be the Christ, call ten thousands of legions of angels and deliver you from that cross. Can you imagine if he had done it? If the humanity in him had overrode the deity in him. And we, he would have taken himself off that cross to save him. Self, the pain and the suffering. You and I would have had no hope. But we don't have to worry because he conquered that temptation a long time ago. Can you imagine if he would have taken the devil up on being ruler over all the earthly kingdoms and said, yes, I'll bow down to you. Just make me popular right now amongst all these people. What kind of king would we be serving? An earthly king that can only move at a horizontal plane and would have no vertical power at all. We don't have to worry about that because he conquered that in the desert. And when those temptations came around a second time, he just flipped them off. I've got a different value system than that. I've got a different priority than I'm different from the world. With our hands lifted up, we love you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to build our value system, God, on you, Jesus. Help us, Lord Jesus, to build our priorities, God, and find them, Lord Jesus, in you, Lord God. Help us, Lord Jesus, the easiest temptations were the ones in the wilderness 
The easiest ones to get through were the ones in the wilderness when you look at the big ones that came later on. The ones that made the most difference. Thank, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for conquering them when they were easy because when they really were going to make a difference for me, you had already gotten through it. You had already done it. How about you and I, ladies and gentlemen? How about you and I? How about you and I? Are we building a home that's different from the world? Or does our home look just like the world's?
family life here tonight. If you, if there is a unit here, I'd like for you to be together. If there's a unit, a husband and a wife, a family, kids, if my, if my children will join me up here, please, on the stage. If you're a single, then, then what, what we're about to do, you do, because this is your home. Your, Mark and Rain, come up here, please. Get with your families. If you have family here, if you have children here, if you have a son or a daughter, whatever it is. Whatever it is, there's only two kinds, I think. <laughs> That's right. to each other. We're gonna we're gonna wait. We want to make sure everybody gets with their family. And if you if you're a single unit, then that's then this is your family. You gotta talk to yourself. Sometimes it's a little bit easier having other people because they hold you accountable. You single adults, you're gonna have to determine. Make up your mind. Maybe you find somebody to hold you accountable. Maybe you find a partner, a prayer partner. Prayer, when I say prayer, 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 prayer. Partner, not just a partner, but a prayer partner. Yeah. Prayer partner. And you say, hey, hold me accountable. I'm making some decisions. Ask me these questions. Maybe call me up once a month. Ask me these questions. These are accountability partners. Trust me, I'm glad I got this woman in my life. She holds me accountable. I hold her accountable. And when I look at my kids, they don't have to say a word. They're holding me accountable. They don't even know it. So, we're building a home. Look at your, look at your home. Look at it. Come here. It's my home. Look at, your, look at your family. If you can't look at them, it's a good good place to start doing that. Look at them. Look at them. And I want you to say to each other, and I want you, if you single parents or you single adults, I want you to say it to yourself. Say, I commit to you. We're going to build our home on godly values and priorities. And I want you to hold me accountable. We all say it. That's right, because we're holding each other accountable. To so hold me accountable to the value system that comes from the Word of God. And if there's anything up from the world that creeps in, let's get it out. And let's build this thing and create something that's going to last into eternity. I commit to you. And the devil has no foothold on a person that's committed the values and the principles that we just talked about tonight. Now I want you to hug each other. If you're family, give each other a kiss. If you're a single adult, shake somebody's hand. Find a man. If you're a man, hug their neck. If you're a lady, find a lady, hug their neck.
Jason Lindley for youth by Young Adult Retreat. Got a seat for the Jason before you leave. Have a great week. Have a great week. Remember, live in the priorities and the values of God. Right, Young people and parents, if you need information on recharge, I've got that up here tonight. Thank you.